What do you know about that basement? Well, let me think. Nothing? Come on, Jake, for Christ's sake. Strain that little boxer brain. You must know something. I've come to get O'Leary several times, but they always make me wait in the dining room. One day it was so late that the restaurant was closed. They made me call from a payphone in that alley over there to let them know I was here. A few minutes later, O'Leary came out the back door, that red one there. All right, you stay by the payphone. Wait till I'm inside. If you see anyone, call the same number you did that one time. There's one on each table, except this one. It looks like a summary of all the bets that come in. Day, amount, bet, wagerer. Wait a minute. Did O'Leary himself bet five grand on Yale? Limited edition copy two of three. Dunn had $200 in his safe. O'Leary had about 20,000 in a drawer. Painting concealed file after file of celebrity reports with all sorts of shady information, ranging from S to Z. Almost all of them were athletes. Is that what O'Leary meant when he said that detectives and police officers were his friends? Thorpe had been a rising football star before the war, which he came back from with honors and decorations. After the truce, he resumed his career he won three season trophies and a couple of MVP awards. He retired after an accident that left him paralyzed from the waist down. He started his own sports advertising agency four years ago, but according to the files, O'Leary hadn't even tried to corrupt him. According to Stone's report, he was so clean, not to mention hard to corrupt, that O'Leary opted for a more subtle strategy. Apparently, when he broke up with the tennis player Helen Moore, he set her up with Stone. Lucky for him, they hit it off. As I put away the report, I stopped in my tracks. Did I really want to risk knowing what O'Leary had on my good friend, the incorruptible police commissioner? I sighed in relief. O'Leary had tried to buy Smirnoff on several occasions, but failed. Luckily, O'Leary had nothing on him, or me. In Bobby Yale's folder, all I found was a log of his incredible stats as an aspiring champion. 20 victories, 16 by knockout. Although, at the end of the report, Someone had underlined one word several times. Untouchable.
Strange as it may seem, the reports reveal that O'Leary had hired Jake as a bodyguard precisely because he was absolutely clean. Apparently, he liked to surround himself with honest people when he mingled with the high society. Helen Moore's file was, by far, one of the juiciest. She had been just a run-of-the-mill tennis player until O'Leary launched her career by rigging enough games to help her climb the ranking. However, O'Leary hadn't fixed any of her games in over a year. Luckily or not, files in through R included no one that I could somehow connect to the case. Dunn's integrity was legendary, even in O'Leary's shady reports, just like Yale had said. Dunn had kicked one of O'Leary's men out of the gym when he found him snooping around. Jake. Someone was coming. Are we, or are we not, exemplary workers, Jim? And we're working extra hours. Hey, Jimmy, what do you think about that? I think he's scared stiff, Desmond. <laughs> Why's that, Jimmy? We're giving you the red carpet treatment. We even let you in the boss's office. You're one lucky fellow. <laughs> you can't say I don't treat you well, Jimmy. <laughs> Yeah. Speak, you moron. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, very well. Uh, why are you... Shh. C calm down. How long have you worked for me, Jimmy? Three, th th three months. Three months. Oh, yeah. I hired you right after your cousin Martin died. <laughs> I need your opinion. How would you punish someone for ruining an innocent man's life with a hit and run, Jimmy? I, I don't know. And tell me, what about you, Wilson? What would you do? He was a good guy. <laughs> of course, you already knew that. You knew him better than me, right? <laughs> he was my cousin. I. That's why I hired you, Jimmy. You see, Martin was a dear friend. And his widow said you were a nice kid. That you do a good job, and you needed the money. And I, I have a soft spot for those in need. Please. But, uh, you know what? I talked to her just yesterday. She told us you did some naughty things to her with that gun, Jimmy. I was glad I hadn't risked my life to save Jimmy. Maybe not even someone like him deserves to die. But... One could also argue that I didn't deserve to die for someone like him. Who's your boss? Give me a name! Cassidy. It was his idea. He said you'd hired me if I'd managed to scare the widow, and I just... All right, all right. Let's just... Calm down now. It's gonna be okay. There are two sacred principles. They rule my life. The first principle is the love for my family. I do anything to protect them. The second principle, I never put my future in the hands of fate. If anything threatens either of these two crucial principles, I take matters into my own hands. You see where this is going? No, I, no, 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 I just... Stop I, interrupting I, I, me, Jimmy! No. It's not polite! Sorry. They're all the same. So rude! You know what? Let's leave it at that. 
You're going to give a message to that disgusting walrus Cassidy, aren't you? Yeah, 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 sure. Whatever you say. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Good boy. What? 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 what, what, what what's the message? Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. You still don't get it, do you? You are the message. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Come on. Wrap him up. Make sure Cassidy gets the message for breakfast, will you? I hope he chokes on it. Got it. Hmm, where are you hiding, little fishy? Once again, you didn't get to hear the end of my story. Just where do you think you're going, putty kiss? <laughs> if anything threatens either of these two principles, I take matters into my own hands. The first time that someone died because of me, even though all I did was rat him out, well, that guy ended up in the Hudson River, right off Pier 27. He's got to be even wetter than that fish by now. You should have seen his face. It's but interesting what comes to mind when you think you're about to die. Suddenly all I could think about was how much I wanted a pet fish. You too, Bruce? Anyway, I was 14 years old, and I still dream about it. But it's a widow, and it sucks. And, well, that's it, I think. <laughs> you know, Black Sad, I never made it this far. I didn't want to interrupt you because I respect you and your word, but I'm actually here to help. Your wife is having an affair with Colbert. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I don't respect your word. And since you brought me no proof... Check my coat pocket, on the right. <laughs> oh, black sad, black sad, black sad. <laughs> ah! Oops. <gasps> Thank you very much. And sorry for jumping to conclusions. First, you get a random beating from Wilson. And here we are. When you shared what you'd found in Yale's apartment, well, it made me sort of want to trust you. But as you well know, you can't trust anyone in this world. Oh, Black Sad. Aren't these odd hours to pay me a visit? Your message was important, but certainly not urgent. It could have waited until tomorrow, don't you think? At this very moment, I could write a couple of pointed, ironic remarks for the narrator to recount what I just lived through. The dark, crooked alleys of New York reminded me of the state of my own soul. Hmm. No. Fall loomed over me with the Fall struck me with the full force of my long-lost youth. Nah, not that. Fall descended over me with the full weight of a guilty conscience. God, that's worse.
well, Mr. Blackmore. What can I do for the FBI? What every blue-blooded American should do. Ride the wave of success on a global scale if possible. <laughs> yeah, sure. We have to beat those commies on every battlefield, be it in Korea, Clay Court, or Wimbledon. But that's not what you mean, right? Maybe if we could speak in private? Alec! Coming! You've got four minutes, Mr. Blackmore, so... Make them count? They say you're currently involved with Al Stone, the boxer. Is that correct? Wow. The FBI sure knows what it's doing. So, out of the 100 million Americans who know about that, who did you extort to get such highly confidential information? Don't beat around the bush. We know why you're with him. Oh, so you like his biceps too. Desmond O'Leary asked you to seduce Stone. Why? What? No, I met Al by chance at a party. A party hosted by Desmond O'Leary. No, that can't be. No one is that shrewd. Not even him. Damn, I hate that bastard! I'm convinced you're part of a dangerous international network that smuggles... champies. <laughs> For a moment there, I thought you were serious. Glad to see the FBI has a sense of humor. Wait, I get it. They must wrap your FBI sandwiches in gossip magazines. The thing is... well... <laughs> you see, I'd love to wipe out that part of my past, but... whatever. Do you have any regrets? Ads pay more than trophies. Can you believe it? Being associated with such a shady character could only damage my reputation. Trust me, never get involved with a married man. Anyway, at least now I know why you mentioned the rigged games. I can't blame you, Mr. Blackmore. I understand why I seem suspect. Although, I doubt the FBI would ever get this involved in a sporting scandal. <laughs> what do you really have against O'Leary? Every criminal organization has blood on his hands. His is no exception. And we have proof. Well, what's the big deal? At least it's not a matter of, uh, I don't know. Smuggling champies. I'm serious, Miss Moore. America can't afford to let anyone shake its foundations like that. You have a light, sir? Thanks. I don't know what you want me to say. You're trying to frame O'Leary, perhaps rightfully so, but I think you're barking up the wrong tree. Believe me. If I had the slightest... Come on, Helen. <sighs> Time to work on your backhand. Let's go. <sighs> Do you smoke? Nice meeting you, Mr. Blackmore. Did you bring my water? America's sweetheart gave you her cigarette? Dear God, she has the hots for you! I can't believe you said good old weekly to investigate that stupid walrus while you were hanging out with Helen Moore herself! So, what do you say, you and me, we change places next time, huh? Your turn. Now tell me, what did you find out? Ah, you're gonna love this. You ready? I've got news, but I happen to also have a pla- uh. Black Sad. My husband has disappeared. What? Who is- oh, oh, Mrs. Colbert. Uh, but what just happened? Is there anything you didn't tell me? Maybe. But now it's your turn. Tell me about Cassidy. 
Come on, spit it out. I didn't find anything suggesting that Cassidy had anything to do with Dunn's murder, but... That's quite the tale. But I know Cassidy will be playing poker tonight with one Howard M. Farnham II, a Texas tycoon looking to get his claws on the boxing business. I also know that he and Cassidy have never met in person, and that Farnham, who's staying at the Balford Hotel, hasn't left his room. Apparently, he spent the night with three bottles of bourbon. So, here's my incredible plan. John Blackmore, I work for Frank Cassidy. He asked me to bring you these bottles so you could choose which one you prefer for the game. Oh, sure. I was fixing to leave, but I guess them monuments ain't going anywhere. <laughs> well, come on in, then. Getting in Farnham's room was easy. Earning his trust was another story. But I always have an ace up my sleeve. You told the husband, and he restored her honor, right? Something like that. Well, then, what's the problem, son? You did the right thing, and that pig got what he was in for. Listen here, you're gonna get your reward, son, from our Lord Jesus in this here bottle. One of the tricks of this trade is to be wary of the biases we all have. They cloud our judgment and blur the person in front of us, painting them with the shades of our preconceived notions of who they should be. But every once in a while, you run into someone so locked in personality that they can only be regarded as a stereotype. Farnham was a disgrace not only to himself, but to Texas and the entire human race. To think I had to impersonate him. I wish I was like you. You seem so content, so free of burdens. Stop right there, partner. You think this old dog don't have ticks? Let me tell you something about my first wife. What can I do for you, sir? So I got a Vietnamese shave last night. No, time. I remember you. Take a seat. Don't tell me, Billy Pie. This here is my new friend Fido. Am I right? Shown up, but your slasher friend sure could learn how to treat his customers. Hey, Billy Bob, come on. This guy's a good guy. He's one of us. My apologies, sir. Hey, come on. Let's get in there before they finish all the bourbon without us. I haven't frisked him yet, sir. I don't think that'll be necessary. Mr. Farnham here, he's an honest Texan. And I'm sure he'll hand over his weapon if we ask him to. Right? Sure, but you better take good care of my girl. It'll be my pleasure. Chips are on the table and guns are in the safe. Now. We got a lovely night of poker ahead of us full of smoking and bourbon. So let's get started. Take a seat, Mr. Farnham. Let me introduce you. To my right, wearing gray boxers and weighing in at 140 pounds, the owner of Pink Vice, the largest meat market in all of Manhattan. In other words, a real son of a bitch. No offense to the women he exploits. Our reigning champion, Oswald Quince. A title I aim to keep. <laughs> Sorry, partner. You ain't got a chance in hell. But look at it this way. You're fixing to learn new tricks. Really? So we're colleagues then? Yeah, you wish, Quince. He owns a casino. Damn. 
And it's not even in Austin or Dallas. It's actually in a little town called, uh, uh, yeah, what was it? Darn it. I, I looked it up the other day. It had a funny ring to it. You mean Ding Dong, Texas? <laughs> ding Dong. That's it. Well, casino or no casino, let's just hope he doesn't keep as many aces up his sleeve as the late Ventimiglia, huh? Amen. To my left, wearing brown boxes and weighing in at 396 pounds. Frank, show some respect, huh? The hospitality tycoon, Polly. Polly. Tycoon? I just own a small bar with pool tables. Clients drink close to nothing and play even less, but certain business transactions just couldn't happen anywhere else. Damn it, Polly. Why don't I know your last name? Because they took it away from me. You have no idea how good my ex-wife's lawyer is. <laughs> Women, they even take our damn names. <laughs> You're too much, Polly. When you're done sightseeing, why don't you drop by La Iguana for a game of pool, and I'll buy you a drink. But I have to warn you, my clientele isn't crazy about furry fellas such as yourself. This guy here wants to start a boxing association in Texas. Guess who he's turning to for advice? To be honest, several things got me worried, so I'd be much obliged for any counseling. See, you've done your homework. That bastard wouldn't accept the most basic rules. For example, banning boxes from official competitions when the managers don't belong to my association. Hey, don't get me wrong, I'm sorry for his death. But if they ever find the murderer, I'd be glad to pay his lawyer fees. We respect traditions in this establishment. Poker is as boring as it is simple. All you need to do is read people's faces. And even the worst detective has that trick up his sleeve. The real issue is knowing what to play for when there's much more than just money at stake. Bring out the bourbon, Billy Bob. Come on. Come on. Give me, give me the bourbon. Maybe I spoke too soon when I said that poker is easy for a good detective. Let's just say it's relatively simple. There's always someone ready to surprise you, relatively speaking. <laughs> Well, I'll be damned! I don't believe this! I hope you're ready to lose it all, my friend. <laughs> Poor Farnham. Came looking to make big bucks in the city with his boxing, and he's gonna lose it all with poker. <laughs> I hope your counseling will make up for it. Ha! <laughs> That's some piece of news, huh? Hey, I don't know if he did it, but the real problem is that the fight against my champ Stone might not even freaking happen. The good news is that I've almost convinced the governor to let him out of prison on the day of the fight. Let's steal another hand before Quince accuses us of trying to break his winning streak. Six, what well, that's something. I don't know how you deal with all of them. All oh, boys, does it have to be now? Oh, never let Quince near one of your daughters. Come on, Folly. Children are sacred. I won't Cassidy. lay a finger on them until they're 12. After that, well, <laughs> let's just say some men have needs that uh, can only be met by a young girl that age, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I bet you're as bad at hiding those poor girls as you are at keeping that ace up your sleeve. What? You lying piece of shit! Quince! Uh, don't believe a word he's saying, Frank. Don't you dare call me Frank. Billy Bob. It's 500 more <laughs> for washing up. It's a deal. <laughs> and good call, Farnham. I owe you one. Call me, Farnham. 
Their behavior at last night's game was utterly insulting. Never contact me again or I'll put an end to your pathetic life. If our common acquaintance should ask you about your business endeavors, tell him that boxing is too violent for you. Signed, Frank Cassidy. Dear Mr. Cassidy, Though I'm grateful for your kind help, last night's game made me realize that boxing is just too violent for a peaceful Texan like myself. I have decided to invest elsewhere. Yours sincerely, Howard M. Farnham II. Black side. Finally, I need you at the gym now, please. Did you call the police? No, only you. Good. Mm, I think it belongs to the new cleaning lady. Mary just wasn't working out, so. Pessimist, are we? 
It's like remembering the last day of summer. Scenes full of joy, picturesque landscapes, and yet the light is faint and the air is still, the calm before the storm. We met in the army. <laughs> we were all professional athletes. They called us the Olympic Five. Who's the guy on the left? Ah, Viktor Sukovsky, the athlete. You've probably heard of his medals. Who's the guy on the right? Angus Mitchell, our combat medic and a doctor with the New York Warriors. It was Spano who got him assigned to our platoon. Hey, isn't that Craig Spano? The guy on the Morley's billboards? Yes, indeed. Our captain. He was the oldest, after all, and star of the New York Warriors. <laughs> he was an orphan, you know. But he loved the sport so much that he said baseball was his family. He was the one who had Mitchell assigned to our platoon. Was Dunn already boxing? Yes, he was. I had already seen him fight before I even met him. He was as humble in the ring as he was in life. He'd always let his rivals take the initiative. I remember how he barely dodged the blows. If you didn't look at his feet, it seemed like he wasn't even moving. And the footwork, pure dancing. You could almost hear the music. The song would play until his opponent was exhausted. Then came the drum roll, followed by Dunn's victory by K.O. What happened to all of them? Zukovsky died the same day the injured Dunn. Dunn received an honorable discharge and came home. He quit boxing and opened his gym. Mitchell was redeployed to a field hospital. Spano and I continued in the same unit, but nothing was ever the same. You see what I meant with the last day of summer. And after the war, well, who the hell cares? I think I saw Mitchell not too long ago, but I can't remember where. Seriously? Please try to remember. I'd love to hear from him again. I'll do my best. You think Spano might have been involved in Dunn's death? Spano? No way. He and Dunn were always... Well, Spano's changed so much that it's hard to say. Maybe Dunn stayed in touch with Mitchell or Spano. Maybe even with both. But he never told me anything. Maybe Sonia knows. I doubt it. But that's not the only question I've got for her. May I? Yes? Sonia? No, she's not here. Who's calling? Where is she? Have you ever wished you'd never been born? I live with that constant thought. Then we're both in the same boat. The first time was right after moving to New York. I hated my mother. She was the reason we moved from the countryside and the smell of freshly mowed grass to this dirty city and the smell of medicine. Her medicine. The second time was after she died. I hated myself for having hated her before, for not having loved her enough. The third time was when my father shut himself off. I hated him for that, for abandoning me, for giving in to the booze. Now he's dead, so take a guess. You hate yourself for having hated him. Yes, but that's not the worst of it. The problem is I don't know how to live without hating him. Over the last few years, everything I've done was meant to push my father far away. To avoid being like him. To avoid making his same mistakes. Without him, I just don't know who I am. I need someone to blame. Without that someone, I have only myself to hate. Hate me? A good detective would have found the killer by now. That's nonsense. You've already come so far. I'm sorry I haven't been a little more. You're as smart as you are kind. That's what my father used to say. Why would you think that? Did you go to my father's apartment? Yes. The thief went there before coming to the gym. 
which leads me to believe he didn't find what he was looking for. And what was he looking for? That's what I intend to find out. Your father sold his apartment. The new owners move in in two weeks. What? I'm sorry. I think he used the money to buy a new place with Mary Purnell. You'll have to talk to her sooner or later. My father? Even now he finds new ways to make me hate him. I found a baseball glove with Spano's autograph in your room. Oh, I've never seen it. My father must have put it there, although I don't remember him having a signed glove. It's odd that there are practically no toys or memories of your childhood in the room, except for a small music box. That box? It might just be my last happy memory. It's from before my mother got sick and we moved here. I loved reading stories about pirates. So, my father drew a treasure map for me. I searched the whole house, one clue at a time. It led me to this enormous tree in the yard where Daddy had put up a, a tire swing. X marks the spot, so I, I dug to find my treasure. I loved the music it played, the ballerina and the little secret compartment. Oh, the secrets I kept in there. I think it's the first time I heard you call your father, Daddy. Oh, really? <laughs> I found a picture taken during the war. <laughs> the Olympic Five. Did you meet any of them, besides your father and uncle? Well, Uncle Tim actually isn't my uncle. No? He and my father loved each other like brothers. Did he tell you that he saved his life? Your father saved Thorpe? They were flying over Brittany in a three-unit fighter plane. Zukovsky was the pilot, my father was the co-pilot, and my uncle manned the machine gun. Suddenly, enemy fire killed Zukovsky and injured my father, which is why he never boxed again. My uncle jumped out of the gun turret, ran to the cockpit, and managed to pilot the plane to safety. Oh, the times my father told me that story. Did you ever meet Spano? What can you tell me about him? I think I saw him once, but I was just a little girl. I think my uncle turned him into a star. Anyway. Thanks for the company. Sonia, thank you. Aren't you coming? Hmm. Maybe Dunn used the same hiding place once more. <laughs>